Good morning. It is good to be here this morning, and I am especially grateful for that very illuminating paper of uh, Carol Newsom and the powerful presentation from my colleague, uh, Pamela King. As my colleague uh, Chris Hayes uh, said in his uh, kind introduction, I read uh, Second Temple literature such as Ezra, Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi through the lens of modern political and economic theorists in order to understand better the political action and economic phenomena in the Bible. The aristocratic oligarchy of post-exilic Yehud, composed as it was of returned exiles, would have viewed the notion of moral and religious conscience as a powerful tool and stabilizing force with which to reinforce political stability and economic efficiency in their society. The story of Persian era Jewry, as told in Ezra and Nehemiah, centers around themes of reform and reconstruction, undertakings which require participation from a wide spectrum of influential actors across society. And the, and the text suggests that leaders of the time realized the powerful role that religious consciousness and shared inherited values could play in enabling the changes they sought. Millennia after the development of the Ezra and Nehemiah narrative, modern social scientists are still working to describe and understand the importance and role that these forces play in shaping the actions and affections of society. Even during the early Enlightenment period, with its elevation of and focus on the role of reason, philosophers including David Hume, Adam Smith, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau maintain that reason on its own cannot provide the motivating force to ensure individual and collective action. As religious and value-based motivations influence patterns of behavior in both individuals and groups over time, they can become accepted as social norms serving as guidelines about what constitutes proper behavior for those seeking to acquire and retain status in society. In this way, individuals' own sense of their selves, especially those of individuals in prominent positions within society, can come to influence even economic outcomes and political action on a grand scale. In the Ezra Nehemiah narrative, we see this process at work. Biblical readers have noted the parallel between the reforms carried out by Ezra and Nehemiah in the physical and metaphorical action of wall building. One commentator notes, and I quote, Ezra and Nehemiah is a book about the building of two walls. End of quote. Tremper Longman explains, and I quote, most obviously we recognize Nehemiah's wall, a wall that physically separates the people of God from their enemies, the unclean Gentiles. On the other hand, Ezra's, Ezra's wall, the law of God that it was his mission to teach, erected a spiritual boundary between Israel and all other people. In essence, Ezra's law, which included a strong emphasis on the prohibition of intermarriage, constituted a people fit to live within Nehemiah's walls. At the end of the book of Ezra, we have a holy people dwelling in a holy city, end of quote. Ezra and Nehemiah, reformers endorsed by the Persian imperial government, attempted to leverage the power of slow moving institutions, also known as informal institutions, by expounding on and appealing to the traditional values of kinship and Yahwistic faith in order to align local economic and political interests with those of the Pax Persica. As political leaders, their bicultural identities and dual loyalty granted them a unique vantage point from which to shape the development of society, but also presented them with significant obstacles to creating change. As newly installed representatives of the foreign imperial power in an environment which was also populated by other established and local influential actors, they would have needed to tread carefully to avoid compromising their own authority. In such a setting, harnessing the power of informal institutions by encouraging the revitalization of traditional religious ideals and norms which purported to govern conduct throughout society was a way of transforming the potential weakness inherent to their outsider status into a source of strength. These strategies' reliance 
on informal institutions did not just suit Ezra and Nehemiah's unique situation as leaders. It was also tailored to maximize their influence in an era and a society where the role of formal institutions was limited, diminished, and uncertain. Societal values play crucial roles in transactional processes between individuals. Hence, institutions are not entirely ruled by economic or any other kind of logic. Institutions play a key role in minimizing uncertainty in human social interaction. And this is particularly the case when they reduce risk in economic transactions. Whether the mechanisms by which they do so are informal, that is norms of behavior, societal codes of conduct, or formal laws and rules. Both forms require enforcement. However, formal institutions are typically represented and upheld by the state. In a society with an underdeveloped, weak, or internally conflicted state, the role of informal institutions can be correspondingly more influential. Persian era Yehud was such a society, decentralized and diffuse concentrations of power with a few clearly identifiable institutions of political or economic exchange. Scholars tend to agree in their assessment that throughout the Achaemenid period Yehud, was politically and economically an underdeveloped province. The absence of law, governance, or any sort of formal institutional representation in the province was accentuated by the fact that the primary offices of the nation were not in operation. Not only was the monarchic institution vacant, but the principal religious infrastructure, long a source of formal institutional authority, also lay in obvious disrepair. In the Second Temple era, moral sentiments played a direct role in swaying the actions and affection of everyday Jews. Informal social rules frequently defeated the efforts of even the most zealous revolutionaries, a point that Nobel Prize winning economist Douglas North has explored in his work. North points out how reform reformers often fail in their efforts to bring about societal transformation when they focus on changing the formal rules, but, under, but underestimate the fundamental importance of informal conventions and norms of behavior. He points out that although formal rules may be changed overnight, the informal norms usually change only gradually. However, it is the norms that lend legitimacy to social action and especially change, since they are undergirded by communal values conventions, and codes of conduct. When Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BC, he issued an authorization for exiled peoples to return to their places of origin, including the Jews in Babylon. Since Cyrus's time, multiple waves of diaspora Jews had trickled in from their places of exile to the province of Yehud in hopes of contributing to the rebuilding of the spiritual economic, and political vitality of the land of their forefathers. The account of Ezra's mission to rebuild the central cultic institution and Nehemiah's visit to fortify the walls around Jerusalem are crucial in illuminating the socioeconomic aspect of the restoration period under the Achaemenid rule. For both Ezra and Nehemiah, the initial focus on the rebuilding of the infrastructure in the decrepit city rapidly expands the, to the task of renewing the identity, institutions, and solidarity of a fractured post-exilic period. In recounting how the members of the diaspora jury were determined to rehabilitate the community of Yehud, despite persistent opposition from outside and manifold challenges from within the community, Ezra and Nehemiah are consistent in attaching the unambiguously theological and political purpose which undergirds the restoration program. Social theorists have stressed time and again that successful attempts to bring about economic or political change must incorporate a community's beliefs, morality, and culture. In the case of Ezra, this incorporation is made directly. Indeed, Ezra would later become known as the second Moses after he brought the Torah from Babylon, opened the book in the sight of all the people, and read from it. Nehemiah 8. Ezra taught the Torah to his people as King Artaxerxes had commanded him in Ezra 7. The human process of teaching and learning 
and creating the desired knowledge of Yahweh in the heart of the people of Yehud. Ne Nehemiah, on the other hand, in carrying out the economic reform described in chapter five, did not attempt to propose or promulgate a set of laws based on a Torah compliant lending system. He deployed notions of kinship and the fear of God, that is informal institutions, in his political economic activities, seeking to shift cultural values collectively and individually. His approach appealed to the people's hearts and minds, presuming an ability to create practical change in the practices of extending credit, which are criticized in the text. Despite the differences in the tactics described, one may observe that the authors of both Ezra and Nehemiah coincided in their understanding that commonly held beliefs and moral precepts arising from each individual's inner sense of self and the resulting collective cognitive lens play a powerful role in shaping society-wide decision-making processes. In its recognition and usage of this reality in Persian era Yehud, Jewish leaders' invocation of religious ideology and ethical principles served to compel community members to undertake public acts of repair and moral healing in ways that would have been impossible to enact through laws or government enforcement, a lesson that seems as relevant for us today as it was in their situation 2,500 years ago. Thank you.